Drawing lines seems like the easiest thing to do in SketchUp, but there is some subtlety to it that I'd like to discuss. Press L to activate the line tool. Click, move the cursor, and click again to draw a line segment. Notice that there's a rubber band connecting my cursor to the last point that I clicked. If I click again, I can continue drawing line segments. When I want to stop drawing, I need to do something else. I have to switch to another tool or press the escape key to stay in the line tool but stop drawing segments. If however you click, drag and release you can draw a line segment without continuing to draw additional segments. This behavior is set in preferences. You can have SketchUp auto detect the click behavior or you can tell it that you always want to click move click and never to continue line drawing. It's really just your preference. I'll leave it with auto detect and this checked so that I have the option to either click drag release or click move click and continue line drawing. The freehand tool is located on the draw menu. Its keyboard shortcut is command F on the Mac and if you're using my shortcuts this is control F on the PC. You can start sketching by dragging the cursor. Observe that curves are easy but straight lines are more tricky. There's no way to ensure that you get a straight line. Holding down the shift key doesn't do that as it might in some other applications. After you release the cursor SketchUp turns your curvilinear sketch into a series of straight line segments. Parts of the sketch that are very curved create multiple short straight segments and parts of the sketch that were straighter yield longer straight segments. In this area where I crossed over the curve and created an enclosed area, SketchUp filled that with a face and I'll talk more about faces later. I'll press the space bar to switch to the select tool and click on parts of this curve. SketchUp has split this into several different polylines which are collections of segments joined together. The fact that SketchUp has polylines isn't very well known. It's not a command on the draw menu like you might find in AutoCAD. Instead it's something that's sort of hidden behind the scenes. A polyline is just a collection of segments that are joined together and it acts like one object. You can explode a curve and turn it into individual segments. Now I have access to select these individual straight lines. You can join a series of segments that are touching end to end with a Ruby script called Weld. I'll go up to Preferences under Extensions and load Weld. This is made by Rick Wilson of Smustard. I'll select these segments by using a crossing window from right to left, holding down the Shift key and doing it again. I'll go to the Plugins menu and choose Weld. We have the option to close the curve and I'll say no. When I select the curve now it's a single object. Weld works with any number of segments that are touching end to end. They don't have to be curved like this. I'll take the line tool and draw some straight segments like I might have for a floor plan. Right now these are separate individual pieces. To join them together all I need to do is select them all and choose Plugins Weld. We have the option to close the curve. This time I'll say yes. And we also have the option to find faces for the curve. I'll say yes again. Built into SketchUp is something called the inferencing engine. This is something that's incredibly sophisticated and yet very easy to use. And it's one of the reasons why SketchUp is such a great program. The idea with the inferencing engine is simple. SketchUp is going to infer that you want to draw things in relation to the drawing axes or to things you've already drawn. What in AutoCAD is handled by running object snap, from points, object tracking, ortho and polar modes is all handled by the inferencing engine in SketchUp. Let's see how this works. I'll start by drawing a line. Let's say my goal is to draw this parallel to the red axis. I can click when the line turns red. I'd like this line to be parallel to the green axis. And if I were to eyeball it, I'd say this looks about right. But it's not. I have to trust the inferencing engine, especially when I'm dealing with perspective. When it turns green, I can be assured that the line will be parallel to the green axis. 
If I draw up, I can draw it vertically in the blue axis. I'll come over here, and I see what's called a from point. It's a black dot that appears on the end of the line. And it's telling me where it's from. There's a dashed blue line that goes down here and connects down below. So this is directly above that point. I'll click here to infer from a point that I've already drawn. Continuing on, I'll make sure that this line is red. When I come over here somewhere, I'll see a from point that's inferring from the point directly below. And that way I can draw lines that are orthogonal to the axes. To verify this, I'll go into the top view by pressing Command-1, and press J to switch into parallel projection mode. Sure enough, the lines are dead on. I'll look at it in front view, in side view, and so on. Everything's perfect. I'll go back to perspective. Press Command-7 for isometric, and J again to switch back into perspective. The inferencing engine color codes points to give you more information. For example, I'll draw a line from this midpoint, which is colored cyan, to some arbitrary point along the edge, colored red. When I drew that line, SketchUp created a face because I created a closed loop here. More on faces later. Let's focus on the inferencing engine. I'd like to see the front side of this face, so I'll select it and right-click and choose Reverse Faces, and it turns white. Every line segment has two endpoints and a midpoint. The endpoints are colored green and the midpoints are cyan. Every time you draw another line, it creates a new midpoint. You can also infer points that are parallel or perpendicular to a given edge. To demonstrate this, it's necessary for me to rotate all of this geometry. Otherwise, I'd be on axis. I'll use the Rotate tool and just rotate this stuff to some arbitrary angle. Now I'll draw a line starting out here in the middle of nowhere towards the object. As I come in closer, we have lots of different options. After I hover over this edge for a couple of seconds, I can bring the cursor back, and perpendicular to edge will appear. I can then connect that directly to the object. I can be assured that this is perpendicular. In addition, I can create a parallel line. I'll start a new line segment over here, off in the middle of nowhere and I want to make it parallel to this edge. Well, SketchUp already knows about that, because I just drew my last line perpendicular to that edge. It's already on to me. It's suggesting that I go parallel to this edge. If it didn't make that suggestion, I could just come over here and hover the cursor over this edge for a couple of seconds, and come back over here, and then I'd have the option to go parallel. The on-edge inference is red, and it means that you're on the edge, but you're not at the midpoint or the endpoint. I can draw a line from this edge to this edge. The on-face inference is blue. This time I'll draw a line on this edge to somewhere on this face. And I can be assured that that line does not penetrate through the surface. We see it as a dot right here on the back side. The last type of inference is the intersection. And this used to be much more common in previous versions of SketchUp but this has been changed because of the auto break behavior in version 7. Let me show you what I mean. I'll draw a line here off to the side, on axis. I'll draw another line in the same plane that crosses through it. The auto break behavior automatically cuts these lines into two separate pieces. Therefore, if I want to draw a line from this point, it's at one of their endpoints rather than an intersection point. You'll see an intersection when a line penetrates through a surface out of plane at an angle. For example, I'll take this line segment and I'll move it over, I'll move it up, and position it just so it penetrates through this surface. Now if I draw a line, I'll get an intersection point, which is indicated by a red X. This is the point where the line just touches the surface. I can now snap to it and draw new lines to it. Inferences become much more powerful when you learn how to lock them. Locking inferences allows you to reference other geometry without having to directly snap to it. Please go ahead and open the primitives sample file that I've provided. You'll learn how to create all of these primitives in due course, but for now I just want to focus on locking inferences, so we'll stack these primitives on top of each other. The first task is to stack the cone on top of the box. 
so select the cone and press M for move. Orbit over here so you can see the edge of the cone. We want to select the portion of the cone that's closest to the red axis so that we can stack it on the edge of this box. When I hover the cursor over this area right here, I see a purple dot appear and the tooltip says endpoint in group. I can come over here, orbit, while I have it attached to the cursor, and click on the midpoint of the box. If all goes well, they'll be perfectly stacked, and you should orbit around and verify that. Next, we'll stack the cylinder on top of the cone, and this is a little bit more tricky, because the cylinder doesn't have an endpoint to grab. If I orbit underneath and select the cylinder, you'll see that there's nothing to snap to down here. I can grab the cylinder from one of its endpoints and place it directly on top of the cone by snapping to this point. If you don't know about locking inferences, then you'd have to do this with numbers. Fortunately, there's a much easier way. Click this point to start moving the cylinder and move the cursor over in the green direction. Hold down the Shift key and you'll lock that inference. Then you can click somewhere else to reference other geometry in the model. I'll click right here. It says it's constrained online from this point. Now I've positioned it correctly. So hold down the shift key when you're using the inference engine to lock the current inference. This frees you up to reference some other point in the model. Let's select this sphere and move it on top of the cylinder. It's the most challenging object because it doesn't have much to snap to. I'll start by pressing M for move and I'll click this endpoint in the group which is centered on this side of the bounding box. This time I'm not going to use the shift key at all. I'll use the arrow keys on the keyboard. The way I remember this is right is red, up and down are the blue axis of course, and that leaves the left arrow for green. So if I want to move this sphere in the red axis, I would press the right arrow. That will lock the right inference. I don't have to touch shift at all. Notice that the cursor has changed and it shows a constrained online symbol next to the move icon. I can then click right here on the box and I can be assured that the bounding box here is lined up with the box. The next thing I'll do is click this point and I'll lock it in the green direction by pressing the left arrow and then I'll click right here. Then I'll click the bottom here and press the up arrow to lock the blue direction. Then I can click anywhere on the top edge of the cylinder to position the sphere perfectly.